in one form or another a really popular question that people ask and something that I was also really confused about when I was first applying for jobs. I just got back from the gym and today I'm thinking of filming my research assistant Q&A that I've posted on my Instagram at biomedwithv. There are quite a few questions to go through but I'm quite hungry and I'd like to film before the sun sets around 4ish. So we're going to do a little day in a life vlog and answering the Q&As. Ideally, I would have liked to clean my place a little bit. There are boxes and just like laundry everywhere and a pretty messy kitchen. I might just be pushing all of those aside and we'll deal with that another day. Um, the reason there are a bunch of boxes is because I'm moving out of my beautiful home in Cambridge. I'll update you guys on the next chapter of my journey soon. Still have a month or so to pack so you can see like lab related stuff but um, I'll be putting my clothes, shoes, kitchenware and all of that into my boxes. So I've already started here as well. Here's some of what I've got from Sainsbury's. Uh, golden yolk, free range British eggs, English muffins and then some prosciutto. Before I start the q and I'm going to eat first because I'm starving. I've noted down a few areas of discussion and a few common questions here on this little notepad. So the first question that I get asked quite a lot is what are the qualifications required to apply for a research assistant role in the UK? So normally this is stated in the job description itself and there will be essential requirements and then desirable requirements. Usually the essential requirements is a bachelor's in science in a related field, usually in biological sciences, biomedical science, biochemistry, biotechnology, things like that. In some cases, they expect you to have a master's, whether it's a master's in science or a master's in research. The key difference between a master's in science and a master's in research in the UK is that an MSc is usually a half-taught and then half-lab-based uh, program. You learn a little bit more about the subject area in maybe the first six months of your course, and then the remaining six months you enroll into a lab placement that's based in your university. An MRes is usually either a year-long research project or two six-month projects based in different labs. So yeah, I'd say that having a master's makes your application a bit more competitive but definitely not having one doesn't mean that you don't stand a chance if you do have relevant research experience during your bachelor's and I've also got questions asking whether a PhD is required to apply for a research assistant role in almost all the research assistant roles I've applied to after my master's a PhD is not required at all it's sometimes a desirable qualification to have but personally I think if you already have a PhD you'd be quite overqualified to be doing research assistant level kind of work. And I have another bite before answering the next question. I've also got some questions of people saying that they are currently doing a wet lab project, usually in the fields of biological sciences, biosciences, and they really enjoy IT or more computer-based work, and they either like to transition into bioinformatics or become a data analyst. A bioinformatician is someone who analyzes large amounts of data, for example, single-cell RNA sequencing data, spatial transcriptomic, ATEX-seq, and maybe like whole genome sequencing. So they look at that, find correlations of based on what the scientific question is that you're trying to answer and plot it out in a way that is understandable usually in a heat map in circus plot and in the case of spatial transcriptomics it's like different dots clustered together in different colors based on some of the colleagues that i've interacted with some of them have started off for example studying physics or computer science and then later transitioned into bioinformatics in which case the learning curve itself would be trying to understand biological concepts which will take a while but i'd say that you 
can definitely pick up on it because a lot of biology is a lot of memorizing and then understanding mechanisms and principles but there are also a lot of people who start off in wet labs and then choose to later transition into bioinformatics um, what a lot of people do is that after their bachelors for example if they pursued um, biochemistry or biomedical science in their undergraduate studies they then do a master's in bioinformatics or data science um, or computational biology for example and that is usually how they transition into a career that's more bioinformatics focused for someone like myself if i have done an undergrad and then a master's and then currently working also in wet labs it is very difficult to suddenly apply for a bioinformatics based job without any sort of bioinformatics qualification you can do things like online courses for example data can complete the online classes and get a certificate at the end of it data camp isn't the only one there are other things like udemy that's one way to build on your bioinformatics skills outside of your work but then again it's very unlikely that someone will want to employ you just based off things that you've worked on during your free time it is possible but you may need to go ahead and then pursue a phd in something that's either a half wet half dry kind of lab or entirely in something more computational based to answer the data analyst question my understanding is that a data analyst in the context of like healthcare and biology and medicine you usually work in a healthcare consultancy company you need key skills in coding programs for example R, Python, SQL and you also need to be pretty proficient in using Excel one or two people asked me why did I choose to go to Cambridge and why did I choose to move there? Honestly, the answer isn't that deep. When I was applying for a bunch of research assistant roles, I mainly applied to places in London, Cambridge and Oxford, mainly because I am from Malaysia, so I'm an international student and I just prefer to live in a community that's a bit more international. And for me, that was London, Cambridge and Oxford. I did a few interviews and the first one that I got accepted for was based in Cambridge. So I decided to take the offer and then after my master's, which was based at Imperial College London, I then moved to Cambridge. So this next one is in one form or another a really popular question that people ask and something that I was also really confused about when I was first applying for jobs is that which jobs can you actually apply to because if you're an international student you need to apply for a company that can essentially sponsor you. So when you're working you're usually under a tier 2 or now also known as the skilled worker visa and the thing is in order for a company to sponsor your skilled worker visa they need to be a licensed sponsor. This costs quite a lot of money so not every single company would be willing to apply for a license sponsorship and therefore will not be able to sponsor you but that being said larger companies like big universities for example university of cambridge most of the russell group universities big pharma like astrazeneca gsk sanofi they're all licensed sponsors and they will be able to afford to pay your visa and the thing is smaller biotech companies don't often sponsor your visa so how can you know whether or not a company is a licensed sponsor. In the UK government website, there's a whole list of company names. So I've heard from some seniors that they essentially just applied to whatever relevant company that was on that list and see how it went. Another way of knowing is also when you read the job description at the end, they may say you need to have a permission to work in the UK. So what a lot of fresh graduates do is that they apply for something called the graduate visa. So if you graduated with an undergrad degree or a master's, you essentially can apply for this visa to give you an extension of two years to remain in the UK to look for a job. Whilst you're having this visa, a company that isn't a licensed sponsor is legally able to hire you. The benefit of this is that during those two years, if they really like you and they really would like to keep you, they can then think about applying for a licensed sponsor and then sponsoring your skilled worker visa. Visa. Of course, this is not guaranteed. In my case, I was very lucky because I just applied to the University of Cambridge and they have a bunch of international students so the whole skilled worker visa application process was very straightforward and they also reimbursed my visa application fees that was really nice but what i think would be a really good strategy is if you do choose to apply for the graduate visa keep in mind that it is quite expensive i think it is up to 2k so of course this can be a financial issue as well but if you do apply for a graduate visa it's a really good opportunity to work at a more startup or smaller biotech company kind of situation because you get to learn a lot 
more and you get to learn about how they start forming these different pipelines, what goes into establishing certain methods. I think you learn a lot more in a smaller company than you do in a bigger company, for example, even though the salary might be higher. So I've known some colleagues who worked at AstraZeneca and of course they earn a pretty good salary, they're compensated well, but a lot of their day-to-day -day work is very repetitive and very large scale. So you just need to be very good at that one thing that you're doing because as someone who's in their early career development stage, I personally think it's more beneficial to develop a broad range of skills and then slowly narrow it down and refine those skills later on. So immediately starting in a bigger company, even though the pay is higher, if you're only just developing a very limited set of skills, then you might want to consider working in biotech. But of course, this just really depends on where you see yourself in the future. And if this is something that you're happy with, like a very stable lifestyle with a stable source of income, then by all means, go for it.